Before we continue with today's program, it's my pleasure to introduce our director, Kate Omquist Kanaf, to say a few words about the Africa Center. Kate, over to you. Well, thank you, Nate, and uh, good day to everyone. Welcome to all of the Africa Center alumni, to our distinguished colleagues, and uh, many friends who have joined us uh, for this program today. Uh, the Africa Center, as many of you know, serves as a forum for research, academic programs, and the exchange of ideas with the aim of enhancing citizen security by strengthening the effectiveness and accountability of African institutions. We are a Department of Defense Regional Center located at the National Defense University in Washington, D.C. And we carry out our mission of advancing African security by expanding understanding, providing a trusted platform for dialogue, building enduring partnerships, and catalyzing strategic solutions. Accordingly, we seek to generate relevant insight and analysis that informs practitioners and policymakers on topical and emerging security trends and on effective responses to dynamic and complex security challenges. And recognizing that addressing uh, these serious challenges can only come about through candid and thoughtful exchanges, the Africa Center provides opportunities for partners to exchange views on shared interests and sound practices. Uh, and by engaging together uh, uh, with African partners, military and civilian, governmental and civil society, national and regional, you know, we hope to reinforce that we all have valuable roles to play in mitigating uh, the complex drivers of conflict and insecurity on the continent today through enduring and capable institutions. This kind of dialogue, we hope, uh, infused with the real world experiences that we're going to hear about from our panelists today uh, and fresh analysis, uh, we hope provides uh, an opportunity for continued learning and catalyzes concrete actions. Uh, so thank you for joining us for this uh, discussion today on the cyber dimensions of countering transnational organized crime. And thank you in advance to our uh, excellent panelists. Uh, we're really looking forward to this discussion. Back to you, Nate. Thank you very much, Kate. So this is the fourth in a series of quarterly webinars we have hosted to understand the cyber dimensions of African security. Our first webinar gave a broad overview of the general cyber trends and threats. Our second webinar looked at the challenges from state actors. Our third looked at terrorist groups. And in this webinar, we're going to look at how digital technology is influencing another major series of threat actors, uh, transnational organized criminal networks who operate in and target Africa. Um, our focus today on organized crime, as opposed to cyber crime more generally, is deliberate. As digital technology spreads, it is increasingly being used to enable or facilitate many forms of crime. And in digital spaces, it is possible for one actor acting pretty independently to do a fair amount of damage to national security by leaking sensitive information or conducting a denial of service attack, for example. Uh, nevertheless, in the modern digital world, both in and outside of Africa, it's quite different now from what it was at the turn of the century. In virtual and non-virtual spaces, it is less often lone hackers that we see in the movies and more often groups of actors working together who now pose the most significant threats. This is evident in everything from the recent rise of ransomware, like the oil pipeline attack we had in, in the United States by a cyber criminal organization based in Russia, to the rise of organized criminal networks targeting the banking sector in African countries that have embraced mobile finance. In today's webinar, we're gonna discuss three main aspects of the relationship between digitization and organized crime in Africa. First, we wanna explore how organized criminal networks exploit digital technology. Second, we wanna unpack some of the most prevalent and potentially destabilizing forms of cyber enabled organized crime. And finally, we hope to discuss what African governments and security sector officials can do to address this growing threat. We are joined today by a group of panelists with decade of experience working to address cyber threats from transnational organized crime in African government agencies, in the security sector, and in the, in the multilateral organizations. We're delighted to have such a group of experienced people with us today. Um, so I'm going to, their full bio bios are available on the program page. So I'm going to keep my introductions relatively short. Um, first, we have Ms. Edelfried Barbarossa Almeida. She is the director of the Financial Intelligence Unit at the Ministry of Finance in Cape Verde. Prior to her current post, she was the inspector of finance at the country's Ministry of Finance and has also held the position 
of General Inspector of Finance and advisor to the president of Cape Verde's Court of Accounts. She is an economist with a focus on economic planning and development and a graduate of the Leningrad Institute of Finance and Economics in the former Soviet Union. Next, we are joined by Mr. Stefan Konan. He is the principal advisor at the Ministry of Defense in Cote d'Ivoire, where he specializes in cybersecurity, cyber defense, and the fight against cybercrime. He has extensive experience working with army officers, police, and civilians to conduct cybercrime investigations and digital forensic analyses. He is also the founder and curator of Shield Africa, a leading exhibition on homeland security and defense in the African continent. Finally, we have Mr. Yann Leclerc. He is a regional criminal intelligence analyst with Interpol and Enhancing Africa's Response to Transnational Organized Crime, ENACT. He is in charge of ENACT and Interpol's programming on organized cybercrime in the West and Central African regions. And he has 15 years of intelligence analysis experience in both the public and private sectors. We are absolutely delighted to have the three of you with us today. And we're actually gonna begin with you Jan. An act recently released a report entitled Online African Organized Crime from the Surface to the Dark Web. And I think this report is pathbreaking. It does a really great job of explaining the distinction between cybercrime and organized crime, as well as discussing how digital technology is influencing various forms of organized crime in Africa. And I'd like you to draw on the findings of this report and take us through some of the key concepts. Um, could you please explain the distinction between cyber crime, cyber enabled crime, and organized crime? And from the analysis that you and your colleagues have conducted of cyber enabled crime in Africa, how is digital technology being used most perniciously by criminal networks in Africa? Jan? Thank you very much. Uh, first, thank you very much for the invitation. Welcome to the audience. And uh, thank you for the organizer for this great opportunity to share our knowledge and to learn from other participants. Okay, first, uh, let me begin by explaining the difference between cybercrime and cyber enabled crime. According to Interpol, cybercrime refers to crimes against computers and information systems. The goal of these crimes is to gain unauthorized access to a device or deny access to a legitimate user. We also call it high-tech crime. For example, you have the well-known distributed denial of service when many compromised systems are used to attack a single, a single target. You also have various types of malware, such as ransomware. Uh, it's a, a malware that denies a user's access to a system or data until a sum of money is paid. It's quite a, a, a topical issue, actually. Or crypto mining, when the malware is secretly using your device to produce cryptocurrency. Now, uh, a cyber-enabled crime occurs when a traditional crime is facilitated by the internet, such as fraud, theft, or the sales of illicit goods online. It includes online financial fraud, such as business email compromise, or BEC, which occurs when criminals hack into email system or use social engineering tactics to gain information about corporate payment system, then deceive company employees into transferring money into their bank account. Other cyber-enabled crimes are Roman scams, sextortion, or online trafficking in human beings and people smuggling, but also online trafficking of works of art or of small arms and light weapons. As you can see, all these cyber enabled crimes are traditional crimes that have partly moved online. Finally, you asked me uh, what uh, organized crime is. Uh, on that point, I, I will not reinvent the wheel. According to the UN conventions uh, against transnational organized crime, an organized criminal group is defined using four criteria. It's a structure groups of three or more persons. Two, the, the group exists for a period of time. Three, it acts in concert with the goal of committing at least one serious crime. And four, the goal is to obtain directly or indirectly financial 
or other material benefits. The three categories of crimes committed by these groups include the provision of illicit services, the provision of illicit goods, and the infiltration of legitimate business or government. So what do we know about these African online organized crime groups? Some of them are likely to have specific roles assigned for each member. For example, the leader might handle recruitment, whereas group members would be in charge of extracting emails, creating fake profiles, or developing fake websites. Other organized crime groups are likely to form non-traditional organized groups, loosely connected. Small groups would connect, share experience, commit the scam, then share the money, and then would split. Some organized crime groups are probably polycriminal groups engaged in multiple crime areas. These groups, such as the well-known Nigerian so-called confraternities, Supreme Eye or Black Axe, are active online on the African continent, as well as, as, well as abroad, including in Canada, Italy, and the USA. Finally, you asked me, how is digital uh, technology being used most perniciously by organized crime groups in Africa? Well, I tell the worst use of the internet by organized crime groups is when they use legitimate services such as social networks or messaging applications to perform social engineering scans to abuse their victims. Social engineering refers to scams used by criminals to exploit trust in order to obtain money directly or obtain confidential information to enable a subsequent crime. To perform Roman scan or sextortion, African organized crime groups use social engineering techniques. They gather information online about their victims to better tailor the message and to exploit their emotional vulnerabilities. Manipulation of victims is an important feature in financial crime, human trafficking and crime against children online. The victims are contacted, tricked, recruited, and controlled online. What is incredible and terrible is that the whole process can be done online. Thank you very much, uh, Jan, for that really comprehensive and, and clear answer. And, and I think you know one of the things that strikes me when thinking about the relationship between digital technology and organized crime, I think it's important to highlight how digital technology, even if it's they're using similar techniques for traditional crimes, you're, you're getting the formation of entirely new criminal networks. And kind of you mentioned this a little bit in your remarks, but I think a really classic example of that are business email compromise scams, which are groups of hundreds of actors spread across the world many of whom are in Africa that basically share information and use, as you discussed, very sophisticated social engineering techniques to extort governments, businesses, and individuals from everywhere. So kind of building on that point, I'd like you to next give us your sense of the scope and significance of some of these threats. Um, what types of organized criminal networks that operate in or target Africa are in, you, are in your view being most affected by digital technology? And how do different types of organized crime groups active in Africa exploit different levels or, or layers of the internet to foster their illegal activities. You get to this a little bit in, in your report. So Jan, back to you. Okay, so let me first quickly explain what are the three internet levels. Uh, you have the three levels, the surface web, uh, also known as the visible web. Uh, it's where information is indexed and therefore easy to find with standard search engines. Access to its content does not require a special configuration. Examples of surface web uh, websites include Google, Bing, Yahoo, YouTube, or Wikipedia, and so on. The deep web is also known as the invisible web. It's the part of the internet that is not visible to everyone. Its content is not accessible through standard search engine. Generally, to access the deep web, you will need an authorization, that is to say, a username and password, email accounts, social networking websites, cloud service accounts, online banking. Uh, whenever you are connected, it belongs to the deep web. Finally, the dark web. It is also known as the dark net. It's a small part of the deep web. In order to access the dark web, 
you need a special software, such as Tor, I2P, or Freenet, which, hide, uh, which will hide the internet protocol, the IP address of the user. Inside the dark web, most websites are hidden, and users can browse almost anonymously. You can find illegal marketplaces, shops, forums, where drugs, firearms, and child sexual abuse material are sold. Note that dark web can also be used for legal reasons. In Africa, actually, all organized crime groups have benefited from the development of the internet. As you said before, this take advantage of the increase of internet penetration in Africa and the availability of online tools. They are very flexible and their expertise also is growing. We, they are mainly active on the surface web, on the deep web, although criminal activity linked to Africa is also found on the dark web. On the dark web, evidence of human trafficking, hitman services, forged documents, counterfeit currency, child sexual abuse material, and trading of financial information were found in connection to the region of Africa. High volume of personal information of Nigerian and South African origin were found as well to be leaked on the dark web. Illegal products can be ordered and shipped from and to Africa on the dark web. On the surface and deep web, online financial crime are the most prevalent and developing crime on the African web. Business email compromise, mainly originating in Western Africa, is increasingly targeting businesses, administration, and individuals worldwide, including in Africa. It is the most used online financial crime by organized criminal groups connected to Africa. Trafficking in human beings and migrant smuggling are another types of crime facilitated by the internet in Africa. We know that human traffickers use the internet to control their victim, but they shall use it also to advertise the services and products resulting from their exploitation. Similarly, migrant smuggling in Africa is facilitated by the internet. Organized crime groups advertise their smuggling services on social media or encrypted messaging application. The African migrants refer to such information to reduce risks and to choose the best service and the best and the safest route. Another crime area which is abused against children online is developing in Africa. African and non-African offenders most probably use the internet to abuse African children online and offline. A recent survey showed that in Western Africa, 70% of the victims were contacted online. You have also all kinds of trafficking benefiting from the internet in Africa, such as the trafficking in works of art, where the organized crime groups use the internet and social media to facilitate the looting and trafficking of stolen artifacts on continental, but also on transnational levels. You have also illegal wildlife trade online. In this case, African organized crime groups in connection with transnational counterparts increasingly use social media for this trade with the help of middlemen. Some criminals involved in small arms and light weapon trafficking in Africa are using social networking sites as well as to conduct their trade. In this case, online, ma online markets offering illicit products are often extension of physical black markets. Uh, thank you very much, Jan. Yeah, I think that's a really important insight that how, you know, with the spread of social networks, we're seeing the transformation of how goods are being bought and sold in a variety of more traditional organized crime networks in Africa from arms trafficking to drug smuggling. Very briefly, before we, we turn to our next group of next panelists, um, what from your perspective inter at Interpol uh, do you think uh, are the main challenges that African and international security, law enforcement and justice sector officials face in keeping ahead of the cyber enabled organized crime threat? Okay. Based on our public reports, we can clearly see uh, the challenges to come. I will focus more on the response by law enforcement against cyber-enabled crimes. As we noted before, African criminals or criminals targeting Africa are active on the three levels of web, 
However, they are mainly active on the surface and deep web. It may mean that so far, they probably not feel the pressure of enforcement enough to move towards the dark web for their illegal activity. Of course, the surface and deep web permit them to stay in touch with potential victims and customers, and they might not have immediate interest to move to the darkness, to the darknet, sorry, unless the pressure of enforcement becomes more important. We have seen that these criminals are not often based in the same country or even in the same continent as their victims. The first challenge would be to increase police cooperation and exchange of information on people and modus operandi so that law enforcement could implement proactive strategies to fight against these crimes. As we know, criminals not only cooperate, but also use the internet to develop their skills. They meet on social networks pages and even in real life to learn how to abuse people. Police forces should also be not only well equipped, but only continuously trained to develop their skills and knowledge of the phenomenon. Besides, we have seen that many criminals use legitimate tools and services to run their illegal business. These legitimate tools, such as social media, email providers, are often made available by companies based outside Africa. Even though some efforts are being made by some major companies, it is not always easy to get information on suspects from the service providers. A better understanding by police forces on how to deal with these providers and an increased cooperation between African law enforcement and foreign online service providers is recommended. Thank you. Thank you very much. You've done a really good job really comprehensively laying out the scope of the cyber threats and challenges from organized criminal groups in Africa. We're now going to go from this macro level overview to a view of what's going on in a couple of individual African countries, uh, Cote d'Ivoire and Cape Verde. Stefan, let's start with you. You have extensive experience on the front lines of Cote d'Ivoire's efforts to confront organized cyber-enabled crime and cybercrime. What types of organized cybercrime and cyber-enabled criminal networks are most prevalent in Cote d'Ivoire? And what criminal groups or actors are you personally most concerned about? Hello, and thank you to the organizers for this uh, opportunity to share our experiences and to have a discussion. I will begin by illustrating what I'm going to say by talking about a case that, it, that really arose yesterday. There was a, a SIM swap fraud, which caused $25 million in losses uh, to a private company in Abidjan. So a SIM swap, it's a type of fraud that consists for the fraudster in presenting oneself uh, to a mobile telephone operator, ask for a change in your SIM card, say, say you lost your SIM card, and then ask for the number of another individual once they have this new phone number, they are able to ask for or perform financial transactions that require a phone confirmation. So they go to your bank, they ask to cash a check, the bank tries to call you to confirm said transaction. But since they now have your phone number, they confirm the transaction. This is something we, a case from yesterday, it cost $500,000 to a Cote d'Ivoire company. I looked a little bit at, at a few figures to prepare for this. In 2018 and uh, 2019 and 2020 in Cote d'Ivoire, complaints made to police, and I'm saying police because there are other services that are in charge of cyber crimes. In 2000. 18, we were at about 10 million euros in losses. Uh, 2019, 9 million, and 2020, 12 million um, euros in losses. The types 
of crimes that we're seeing in 2018, 2019, and 2020 are mainly frauds that have to do with electronic uh, wallets. In Côte d'Ivoire, for West Africa as a whole, we have seen a boom in a phenomenon we called mobile money. These are electronic wallets that are held on one's phone. In Côte d'Ivoire, there are 12 million electronic wallets held by Ivorians. To give you an idea of the scope of this, there are 700,000 bank accounts in the country, but 12 million bank accounts on telephones. So obviously they have become the main target for cyber criminals. So in 2018, 19, 20, the number one fraud in Côte d'Ivoire has been this fraud against electronic wallets. It has impacted mostly Ivorian citizens or people who reside in Côte d'Ivoire. The second type of fraud has been fraud um, having to do with items that identify individuals, you know, so essentially love chats, identity theft, and this type of fraud also impacts people who are abroad, mainly in the francophone world, so meaning in France, Switzerland, Quebec, Belgium, and sometimes in francophone West Africa. The third type of fraud that we have noted over the last three years are frauds. I don't know if I should use the word fraud, but they're really infractions that that impact the propagation of content. Social political issues in West Africa and Ivory Coast political organizations use the internet more and more to disseminate uh, propaganda, uh, content that is sometimes uh, voluntarily falsified or voluntarily falsified. But this kind of dissemination of propaganda Uganda has a social, political, sometimes religious aspect. And these are activities that are organized by political parties sometimes uh, or others even. So there are three types of fraud that we can noted in the last few years. There's the electronic wallets. There's the identi identity fraud. And then also the fraudulent uh, fake information and so, et cetera. And so these are the three main issues. Thank, thank you very much. Yeah, so I think one of the things that you made really clear is that as uh, digitization spreads and you have economic opportunities, like you mentioned the spread of mobile money in Cote d'Ivoire in recent years, organized criminal networks and groups inevitably follow. So. The implication of that then is it becomes imperative for law enforcement to evolve with these threats. And so I'd like you to discuss from the Ivorian experience managing the growth of these organized criminal networks as the country is digitized. What are the key challenges and, and gaps in your view in Cote d'Ivoire's national capabilities to address the threats from organized cyber and cyber related crime? Thank you. I will I would like to share with you an interesting story, an anecdote concerning Ivory Coast. In the 90s, in Ivory Coast, there was a scourge. It was an attack on the banks from 1990 to 2002. There were many uh, attacks against the banks by criminal groups operated by young people, very young people, 14 to 16, 17. There were two or three uh, robberies, bank uh, robberies. The police had to really uh, deal with this. Today in Ivory Coast, we no longer have bank robberies. 
I would be curious to see the statistics, but there are hardly any robberies. It's really interesting, but it's much more, it's a higher risk on the operational level to do the, have uh, criminal activities on the internet. And so this shows the tendencies that are currently happening in Africa uh, in terms of the digital, digitalization of different countries. So what there is a mutation of the phenomena of the type of criminal activity taking place. Uh, noting this in 2011 in Ivory Coast, uh, there was a platform of the fight against cyber criminality that uh, has been going on for a few years. And this platform uh, fights this phenomena that I uh, described earlier. This platform is a very efficient tool to, to identify and to stop uh, 9,000 criminal attacks that uh, were discovered. There were 200 arrests uh, by per year about. And it is true that we have to uh, make a decision, prioritize these crimes because uh, thousands of crimes per year is, have to be prioritized. But, but this uh, was, ended up with a number of arrests, oftentimes very young people, which made it even more difficult. So we let the parents know. The parents have no clue of, of their children's activity. So this is a really terrible social drama. Um, today in Ivory because the challenge is not so much uh, the investigations to find the guilty. We know that a cyber criminal case can be uh, investigated, uh, but, but sometimes the person is hidden with a, a name or an email or, but the cyber, crim, cyber crime investigations um, seek the real identity. The, th the real challenge is there are three. Everything that is happening after the arrest, actually. How do the legal services, how do the judges, how are they properly trained to, to deal with these infractions and to punish the guilty? This is a, we, there's still a lot of work to do in Ivory Coast. In two, we have a law in 2013 that punishes all the guilty, but it's still not sufficient and uh, to deal with the situation. The judges and the lawyers and all the legal entities are really not up to par. Secondly, uh, the importance of the awakening the population to this problem to better understand uh, the gravity of these problems and what is doable and what is allowable and not. And thirdly, the third challenge, which might be the most difficult to note, are the relations between um, the uh, forces of order and the private citizen. Uh, we try through Instagram, through YouTube to um, improve the relations between um, to the people and um, investigators to get information. Uh, sometimes an operator can, it's a real problem to, to get information from people, but we need a better cooperation with the people and also with banks. Sometimes the person who has the SIM card comes to the bank. We need a better way to deal with the private operators to fight this. So this is a real challenge that we are facing currently and we must find solutions to them. Thank you. Thank you very much. I, I find it really interesting actually how you highlighted that it's not so much in the ability of law enforcement to track or monitor some of these groups and threats that 
the choke point really is what happens when you get to the legal system. And what I find really interesting about that remark is that despite the relative novelty of a lot of digital technology, that's actually a choke point on a lot of other forms of organized crime we've had done, had previous conversations and, and webinars and, and line effort on the Africa Center about security and justice coordination. So it's interesting that that, that comment specifically echoes some of the findings of, of those conversations. So thank you very much. I, I think um, we're now going to turn to you, uh, Edelfried, who, you know, both of our previous panelists, I think, have highlighted the importance particularly of finance as a motivation for organized crime, but also kind of a key way in which uh, organized crime is being altered from a cyber perspective. Um, and as head of the financial intelligence unit with the Ministry of Finance in Cape Verde, this is your area of expertise. So I'd like to ask you, in your view, how is the spread of digital technology uh, influencing how transnational criminal groups in Cape Verde and, and elsewhere finance themselves? And how are or how might changes in financing be influencing the networks and structures that, that make up these groups. Good morning. I am going to speak at a comfortable speed, uh, speed for the translation. Thank you very much uh, for inviting me to participate in this webinar to share ideas and uh, uh, talk about the uh, serious consequences of cybercrime, as we heard, the objective of the organized crime is uh, the profit and uh, uh, to obtain um, profit in a speedy way uh, using the uh, facilities that uh, financial institutions offer. Uh, private organizations and uh, uh, other organi organizations can be targets and uh, uh, they suffer uh, damage in a significant way. Many times these uh, criminal groups uh, attack and we suffer from uh, deficiencies many times we do not collect information uh, enough. That's a problem. There's lack of knowledge. For instance, the malware, many times people don't know that sh they should not give out their phone numbers, but they do that uh, because they lack information to avoid these types of scams. And also the uh, rapid or uh, speedy way in which the uh, money transfers are made um, are, is a problem. Uh, a criminal wants to um, um, make uh, the uh, money that is uh, obtained illicitly uh, in an illicit manner into a uh, illicit uh, um, transfer. Uh, so they want to launder that money. The um, financial institutions should be prepared to detect suspic suspicious transactions. So uh, all of the uh, countries should uh, uh, act in accordance with the uh, uh, GAFI or FATA uh, recommendations, uh, uh, situations uh, of which uh, they uh, officials become aware uh, should be reported immediately and they ha uh, the um, financial institutions should know their clients in our, all of our countries, uh, we should concentrate on money laundering uh, and uh, the um, connection with the uh, judicial system. Uh, the operators and banks uh, act uh, um, internationally, so they have to, ha there has to be a regulating uh, agency 
to avoid uh, that the criminals use the system and uh, are integrated in the system because they uh, buy uh, quote unquote uh, power they uh, they um, by the uh, officials that are working honestly in in these uh, in institutions. So we have uh, to consider all of the actors in this system. The investigation needs to be conducted in a way so that we have uh, um, an answer and we uh, report uh, to the um, relevant authorities. We know that some of the products of these operations um, uh, have a lot of revenue because uh, they uh, create uh, uh, fictitious uh, companies in order uh, to make a lot of money. They use uh, mules uh, they, uh, that go across the borders and so forth. And we need to have a system in which uh, we uh, prevent these operators from uh, acting in this way. In Cape Verde, we are uh, um, following the uh, uh, GAFI uh, FATAF um, recommendations. Can I continue? Can I continue, Nathaniel? I mean, if we have like a minute or two short. Yeah. Temos mais um minutinho, claro. I said that that all the banks, all the financial institutions, should have a system to evaluate the risks, the risks of their clients, in order to follow up. That's what's mandatory, what should be mandatory, according to Gaffey. They should in order they should follow up in terms of the risks in order to mitigate these risks in accordance with um, evaluations of whether you have a high risk or medium or medium level risk or low risk. And then we'll have um, the proper approach. These are the problems which exist, and we have to make sure that these don't happen. Otherwise, these criminals are going to continue manipulating the financial system. Thank, thank you very, very much. Um, are, so I, I think you, you've, you've made really, really clear how sort of the globalization of finance and, and the digitization of finance has made it possible for quick, rapid, seamless international financial transactions that are really influencing how criminal groups are organizing themselves through front companies, through money laundering, through really kind of becoming globalized in a sense that they might not have been uh, before. And you also began to lay out, I think, some of what you, some of the key solutions when it comes to like the Gavi recommendations, the need for threat identification and, and audits. So I'd like for you to conclude this portion of the webinar for us by expanding a little bit on that point. What, what types of capabilities, policies, and laws do you think African governments need to have in place to prevent organized criminal groups from stealing resources, from finding, from financing themselves using digital means, and from, as you pointed out, also laundering money, which is a, a significant concern as well. Thank you very much. Um, as you first, as you already know, there are the conventions, the three big conventions, the Vienna Convention, the Palermo Convention, and one of the best, the Convention Against Corruption. All 
countries um, adhere to these uh, conventions, all of our countries. And we in Africa have the Malabo uh, Convention to which um, the countries adhere. And we also have the Budapest uh, Convention to which most countries adhere, especially the um, Lusophone countries. And I should emphasize that in the course of our uh, adherence, we benefited a great deal from this participation because we had the opportunity to train um, a number of our specialists and our uh, legal ex experts in accordance with new laws. And Gaffi for me is fundamental in order to attack these problems. All countries should obey the rules according to the Gaffi recommendations and evaluate risks. All countries should evaluate their risks. They should have their internal policies and especially financial institutions the, should follow clear laws. The regulatory agencies now, we have a number of them, according to Gafi, for the uh, financial and non-financial sectors. So oh, we have to operate according to these and raise awareness among all of the actors to identify suspicious, suspicious activities in order to identify these criminal activities which circulate among the financial institutions so that we can respond to these challenges and always improve our systems and be, uh, be uh, cognizant of what is happening in our countries. Gafi is working at this level and we verify their recommendations. We uh, are active in this area and we should adapt and revise our legal instruments to act in a, accordance. There are a number of uh, recommendations of GAFI recommendations that allow us to respond to these situations. Th that uh, we allow us to reinforce all of our operations. We have the Palermo Accords that also talk about cooperation. We have um, very close cooperation between our countries and countries have to have even stronger cooperation. We have legal tax. There are countries that don't allow ex extradition, for example. This is a big problem that we have to look into. We have the Medida Convention um, that allow we have to have legislation, very clear, robust legislation to allow countries to recover assets that criminals, that cyber criminals take abroad. So we should have these resources in order to re recover uh, assets that are taken offshore. We we have to work we're internationally in this case. And it's a big handicap that we have when we don't work in this way. So on the basis of these treaties, on the basis of these accords, strong accords, we can have information that we share and be able to establish objectives in order to combat these risks with respect to these criminal activities. I don't know whether uh, I have a little bit yeah. more time. 
Um, I think it'd be we could probably start going into the, the key. Was but, key. Um, but but thank you very very much. I think your your remarks make clear how, as a truly global problem, organized cybercrime and cyber enabled crime requires global solutions, requires treaties, requires international cooperation. You know, even an attack, for example, in a country, oftentimes if it's conducted by one actor against another actor of a country, they will go outside of the country to hide the origin. So it's really, really a tricky global problem. And it's important that countries in Africa and outside of Africa abide by a lot of these treaties and agreements that are in place. Okay, so before going to formal Q&A, we would like to take a brief survey of all of you to inform our discussion. Specifically, we want your opinion on how the spread of digital technology is influencing organized crime in your country in or region. You should now or shortly now see a live Zoom survey populate your screen. Uh, the questions are simultaneously gonna be displayed in English, French, and Portuguese. So can we get that survey up? Great. Um, the question, the first question asks about whether or not you are more concerned about cyber threats from organized criminal networks operating outside of Africa or cyber threats from organized criminal networks within your country or region. Please select one of these two responses and click submit. And on mobile devices, if you're connecting with us today through a mobile device, you should answer the question by touching the appropriate response, which should appear highlighted and click submit. Let's give it about 10 or 15 more seconds for our audience to respond before we display the results of the survey. Okay, can we get the results, please? Okay, so we have a pretty even balance. 58% uh, of our audience is more concerned about organized criminal networks operating outside of Africa, and 42% are more concerned about cyber criminal networks within their country or region, perhaps reflecting the truly global nature of the problem. Okay, we're going to do one more of these surveys and then ask our panelists to give some of their impressions and reactions to the response of our audience. So let's do the next question. Uh, please get that on, on for everyone to answer. Um, the question asks, which types of organized crime in your country and region are being most impacted by digital technology? Your choices include cyber and online financial crime, human trafficking and smuggling, arms trafficking, wildlife and environmental crimes, drug trafficking, and trafficking and other illicit goods like art and motor vehicles. This time you can select any that apply. So again, another 10 to 20 seconds to, to read through the options and respond, and then we'll have our staff display the results for everyone to see. Okay, could we uh, get those results up, please? Okay, so perhaps unsurprisingly, three quarters of our respondents chose cyber and online financial crime as the number one area that they thought was being most impacted by digital technology. Next, we had human trafficking and smuggling, followed at, oh, next actually we had drug trafficking at, at 29%, followed by human trafficking and smuggling at 20%, followed by trafficking and other forms of illicit goods at 12%. And our audience does not appear to be so concerned about arms trafficking, which got 10%, or wildlife and environmental crimes, about 8%. So thank you. So let's give our, our panelists a chance to react about whether or not they feel like the, the organized cybercrime is either within or without more of a threat and in some of the major categories. This time, let's go in the reverse order. Alors, so, um, 
changer l'ordre. On va commencer uh, avec what are, what are your, what are your on our, on our Q&A. And, and if you have questions, questions, uh, please begin to ask them in, in the chat. I think that it depends a lot on the situation of each country. You said that, for example, that arms trafficking isn't that important to some. Um, if some participants here don't have much experience in this area, they won't uh, choose that answer. Whereas um, drug trafficking uh, went to 29%, that, that can be very concerning. The financial profits from that kind of illicit trade has, uh, has huge repercussions and is very concerning for all of us. And we know that the, the drug trafficking is what started, what, what began. And we have, in terms of um, illicit trafficking, and we have so much more information about that. And it's what occurs most frequently in terms of these, uh, these crimes. Thank you. Let's go to Jan. Why don't we, why don't we do you next and we'll end with, with Stefan. Oui, merci. Bon, je vais saisir l'opportunité de pouvoir m'exprimer. Thank you. I'm going to take the opportunity to use my mother tongue. So, yes, there, there is something to note about the first poll. I see that the participants it fear the most the um, criminal networks outside of Africa. I think that a lot of African criminal networks are now, uh, have roots now in Europe, in the US and even in Asia. The organization, uh, for example, uh, of scams is often organized along with people who are living abroad. So they, their headquarters are in Africa, but their members actually operate abroad. So this is an interesting thing to note. Why have people abroad? It's because it enables them to obtain information there on, on site uh, to use bank accounts that are based over there to use for transfer the transfer of funds. And that's an interesting point. And then the results for the second poll, the, of course, the financial crimes were first. It doesn't surprise me, but uh, human trafficking, of course, was also uh, significant. Now, drug trafficking in Africa, it's true that there are not a lot of cases uh, online. This is not something we see a lot of. Now, arms trafficking, just a little bit on this topic. This is mainly a, an extension of the black markets of countries mostly based in North Africa that offer weapons on Facebook, on, on closed Facebook accounts. So you can buy all kinds of weapons. But for Africa in general, it's not something that we see very often. So here's what I wanted to note. Thank you. Thank you very much. I actually think it's interesting in that while uh, on the internet might not be off, um, changing like the market structure of, of crimes like drug trafficking or arms trafficking a ton yet, I think to Ilfried's point, it might be beginning to change some of how the profits, which are enormous, as she points out, are laundered through online financial or digital means. It's another important element, I think, to, to keep in mind. So, so a very interesting kind of conversation and reaction from the two of you uh, there. Uh, Stefan, last word, and then we'll go. Then we'll go to a more formal Q and A. Again, I encourage our audience to begin asking questions if they have them in the chat line. I, I found these questions very interesting. Now, from the standpoint of the localization of cyber criminals, it's a really an interesting issue. A, a very famous author said the world is flat. 
And so no matter where you are, all you need is an internet connection. And certain cyber criminal groups have geographical mobility, essentially. Now, having said that, from my Ivorian standpoint, based in Côte d'Ivoire, we have more concerns, we're more concerned with groups that are located within Côte d'Ivoire, because based on the figures I gave you, there are many crimes involving electronic wallets, which represent the main bank accounts of, of the population, even for the most underprivileged people in the country. They all use this method to hold their savings, to carry out transactions. So it's very worrisome. And I also talked about the uh, diffusion of contents, which often has political um, purposes. And so this is really what concerns me in Côte d'Ivoire. Thank you very much. So uh, we will now move to uh, the question and answer period. I encourage participants, please use the chat function at the bottom of your screen to submit your written questions for the panelists. You can submit your question in any language you like. Uh, we will try to get through two rounds of questions, although I fear we might only have time for one round. So if you have questions, please, please, uh, now is the time. Right now, I'm aware we have, we have two questions that have been asked so far. Um, the first is, what is the difference between the deep web and the dark web in terms of the content and legality of the activities? I think that's probably best suited for Jan to expand on some of the, the uh, points that he made a bit earlier. Votre prochaine question est en français et il est en plus. Another question. In addition to going after these criminal organizations, why uh, do we not do you not go after the companies that create this uh, software? Because those who create the software are complicit, are accomplices essentially, because they have helped a criminal activity. Okay, so um, let's let's have while we wait for other questions, other other questions to Rin, let's let's have our audience respond to our panelists respond to those. Let's start with you, uh, Jan, because one question I think was pretty directly directed at you. Yes, indeed. In terms of the contents, uh, if we compare the deep web and the dark web. On the deep web, you will find, in terms of relative quantity, you will find a, a much lower quantity of illegal content because it, maybe even fortunately, the deep web is really used by people who are not necessarily involved in illegal activities. Now, in terms of uh, the dark web content, there we will find uh, a much greater level of criminal activity. For example, uh, you will find online stores to sell or deliver all kinds of drugs. You'll find weapons, you'll find illegal services. But on the deep web, when you do a, a, a good search, you can find identical services if you know how to do it. Uh, they are harder to find, but they exist there. So the fact that these services uh, are available on platforms where one can be identified, where you have an IP address, et cetera, so certain groups do not hesitate to use uh, social networks for their illegal activities. So what types of illegal activities, uh, all kinds, for, for example, the sale of uh, protected species online. And there are Facebook groups that are very well organized and that are managed by the traffickers. 
uh, and you can find groups that are maybe secret or private, first you have to provide guarantees. But once you are taken into this group, then you can have discussions and the payments can be made online or now on the deep web, there are illegal activities, but much uh, fewer than on the dark web. Okay, thank you. Um, because we're, we're running low on time and continue to continue to compile questions, I'm going to uh, ask them in the chat and then ask our last two panelists to respond um, as they wish. Um, we have uh, another question about whether or not cybercrime is a threat to, organized cybercrime is a threat to maritime security. Um, we have one question on uh, whether or not um, Mauritius has a drug problem and is money required to import drugs going through non-bank cyber criminal digital channels. Um, et enfin, on a une, uh, and finally, there's another question in French. What are the measures taken towards telephone operators? I lost the question, excuse me for a second. It, aren't they uh, complicit, these uh, telephone operators? So now we're going to ask Stefan to speak. Thank you. Thank you. I will talk about this last question about uh, telephone operators. This is a question that everybody asks. Now, these telephone operators, these mobile telephone operators, they are the channels through which we get this internet connection. I mean, even this conference today um, is possible because of a telephone operator. So this is a very much a value added service for communications, but they represent a channel through which criminals, I mean, Jan noted this, they, they use it to contact victims, they use uh, telephone operators to uh, complete fraud, fraudulent activities and to repatriate their funds. So there, these operators have good aspects and bad aspects. So we are asking them for much a much greater level of cooperation. Are they complicit? Are they accomplices? I, at the organizational level, I, I don't think there is any intention from their part to, to be accomplices of cyber criminals. But there have been cases um, where individuals who work for these companies have been complicit. So I talked about the SIM swap case where a mobile operator changed a number of, a, of phone user. You need a, an accomplice within the company. Yeah, I, did, I think it is quite evident with organized crime. There's always a level of complicity within okay. the authorities, um, within the companies. So now I'd like to have Alfred go last. We've actually had, I think, a couple of final questions that I think are very relevant to some of what she's spoken about with us and her expertise. So in particular, um, she the one, one audience member wants to know what can we do without the cooperation of, of other countries. Maybe some countries are reluctant to cooperate internationally. And I think the question is what, what do we do with those cases in those countries? And another question is in terms of arms trafficking specifically, maybe maybe uh, more broadly other forms of trafficking, You know, what are the sources of these arms? Where are they tra tra traffic to? I think our audience member wants to get a sense of you know, what, how the, exactly these networks are kind of structured, who's sending arms where, and where exactly is the online component. So if you have insight into anything that said before, but specifically into mm -hmm. either of those questions, we're going to give you the last word. I would like 
very quickly to complement what Stefan said. The problem many times does not reside on the operator or operators. What happens sometimes, you can um, uh, imagine I have a bank account and I am offered a card and the bank preventively may suspend the card or block the account to which the card is associated. It can block that account for some time. And uh, so I um, have to go to the bank to find out what is happening. The bank may also take more drastic measures to bar the use of the card uh, that is associated to this account. So more than the telephone operator, there's another level. People are not aware that uh, they should not give out their phone numbers. Sometimes I w they want to buy something on the internet and they ask for their phone number. And when the phone number is given out, uh, that is going to be used uh, for cr a criminal actions. The bank has to be very vigilant uh, against such things. With regard to the question about uh, international cooperation, uh, as I said, the, for uh, a, a, the, this cooperation to take place, we have the countries have to be signatories to the different conventions. We have uh, to adopt uh, the conventions to our um, national laws. We have to have bilateral and multilateral cooperation in several uh, forms um, under the principle of reciprocity. And uh, only then we'll have a good, uh, a good cooperation system uh, in order to fight against uh, criminals. All of those uh, cooperations uh, highlight uh, the importance of uh, coordination. If the uh, internal uh, coordination exists and uh, does not um, comply with the uh, uh, international uh, conventions, we may have a problem. The last question, which I didn't really understand. What, I didn't really get the question about the arms trafficking. As it's not all in, as it's in English, I didn't really get the, the thrust of the question. That's fine. We're, we're, we're out of, we're more or less out of time. I, I understand. So, I mean, I, the, the bottom line is that, that I think one of the main ways that, that arms trafficking and many forms of traditional organized crime is being enabled by the internet is through various levels of the web, either on the dark web or more, more commonly in Africa on the service web through social networks that are being facilitating the sale of a lot of these arms from all over the continent. From, from, from you know, I think there's like a, 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 a human smuggling network from uh, North and East Africa into the Middle East, for example, that is being facilitated by the rise of online social networks. But um, with, with that, allow me on behalf of the Africa Center, because we're, we're at time, to uh, thank our excellent panelists for really helping us to understand both conceptually and practically how digital technology is influencing transnational organized crime. And I'd like to summarize what I've learned today. And I've learned a lot today, believe me. Um, through the lens of one, one, one question kind of tried to, tried to get back to the distinction between cyber crime and cyber, cyber enabled crime. And the thing to keep in mind is that cyber crime are crimes that use internet based tools like ransomware, like denial of service attacks to commit a crime. 
cyber enabled crimes are more traditional forms of crime that are enabled by the internet, uh, like social engineering, email schemes. But, but most organizations are poly criminal. Like the, the major organized criminal networks that we're talking about today use both cyber crime tools and also are cyber enabled. And so one of the, one of the and I, so I think it's important to have, as we tried to have today, a discussion about organized crime kind of as a category by itself. And I think for me, at least, this discussion has clarified three main ways in which digital technology is influencing organized crime in Africa. First, the combination of new forms of cybercrime, like things like ransomware, things like uh, denial of service attacks, new forms of malware, along with the spread of the internet, are really radically changing the structure of organized criminal groups. And this is nowhere more evident, I think, than it is in the case of groups, as we've heard today, that commit fraud, right? Be it business email compromised scams, right? Who you have groups of actors working headquartered in, in like Lagos, but who are extorting money from the unemployment insurance system in Washington state in the United States during the COVID-19 pandemic is as one example. We're seeing also these same sorts of organized crime networks as, as Stefan highlighted, attacking mobile money, which now makes up the majority of bank accounts in a lot of places across the continent, including Cote d'Ivoire. Um, second, digital technology is having important implications for how more traditional orga forms of, of crimes or organized crimes are, are organized. They're becoming cyber enabled, as we say. So they're not directly using malware, but social media, social networks enables crimes like sextortion, enables crimes like human smuggling to be facilitated with an ease and access that maybe they, they weren't necessarily being before. And to some degree changes the actors that are being involved. One example is human smuggling, where my understanding is, is that the rise of social networks has really put pressure on middlemen. Before you needed a, some kind of middlemen to organize everything, now you can just kind of smuggle yourself using YouTube videos and, and, and rent the, the materials you need uh, online is, is one example. Um, you know, finally, and I, I think one another big important aspect that, that is becoming even more and more important is that because all crime is financially motivated and organized crime is financially motivated, it's really important to pay attention to not just fraud, but how digital technology is influencing how criminal groups and organized criminal groups are financing themselves and laundering money. Um, I think particularly as, as Edelfred highlighted here, the only way you're going to really deal with these groups is through international cooperation because these crimes really span borders, right? And, and that's that's probably the most significant challenge right now, less the capacity building side as, as Stefan mentioned in his, in his remarks. So the spread of online finance, digital payment systems, cryptocurrencies, it's been talked about principally, I think, in terms of economic opportunities for African countries. But I think this, this conversation to me has highlighted there are also lots and lots of risks without effective regulations and without effective international, regional, corporate collaboration to deal with organized cybercrime. Um, so we're running low on time. And um, while this may be the last word for today's webinar, it's not the last word we're going to have on cyber issues on this topic. Um, looking forward to much more additional programming in the future. My thanks to our wonderful panelists, who I think did an excellent job discussing the ins and outs of organized cybercrime across the continent, some of the major challenges and threats. And thank you to our friends, colleagues, and alumni of the Africa Center who joined us today. Uh, until next time, so long. <laughs>